this means we're on again. I failed to tell you the first hour, so I'll give you an apology now. I become a Christian at about 11 a.m. We started somewhere around 8.30, so you didn't even have a Christian your first talk because he was still asleep. Now I've had some coffee, I'm awake, and I did think of something in between. My, my, my partner in crime here helped me, but I need to stretch just for a minute, you know. I believe this is headquartered in Colorado, Denver. Don't you just like the top of this chair? The blues, you know, they're real nice, you know. What, Keith, what's that say? Seahawks. Seahawks? Oh, okay, all right. I got a class to teach. I'm gonna... <laughs> Why did I do that? Because I'm awake now. All right. Anyway, welcome home. Welcome back. Part two. If I said to you, I, I took too much time, I'm sorry, I'll try and be a little bit cleaner. I get teased at conferences. Love speaking at conferences. Someone says, you need a watch? I go, no, I won't look at it anyway, but uh, I'll put this on my desk and pretend like I'm trying to keep us on time, or at least a little closer. Um, recognize and respond. What's that overview about that we looked at already? It's like world, flesh, and devil, all three are important. Do not allow, I'll give you stereotypes, and I kind of said it earlier before we walk on, but stereotype says if you're conservative Baptist ordained minister like I am, nothing is demonic. It's all about the flesh. It's not true. If you come from a Pentecostal background, the stereotype is everything is about demons. That's not true either. Uh, there's truth somewhere in between. We struggle with world, flesh, and devil. If someone from my theological persuasion says, I don't want to mess with that demonic stuff, uh, I'll just be real good dealing with flesh stuff. Well, as long as you can promise that the only thing you or the people you work with are going to struggle with is opposition from the flesh, I guess that's safe. Uh, just like if you come from a different background and you say, I think there's a demon of the coffee cup. I mean, if everything's about demons, and as long as you can guarantee that the only opposition you run into is demonic, then you can become an expert on the flesh or the world or the devil, and you, you can be the most knowledgeable person on demons that's ever lived or the flesh that's ever lived. Problem is, the Bible says all three are real, world, flesh, and devil. All three are opposition, world, flesh, and devil. And you're going to have to learn how to recognize and respond to all three because you can never guarantee that you're only going to be dealing with one aspect of that infernal triad. So I'm suggesting don't play one against the other. Don't make one more or less important. All three of them are there. I need to learn how to recognize and respond to all three. That's hopefully what we're about. Now, let's go part two. Let's, let's take another step. Yep. Uh, assuming that uh, I'm I'm willing to say you took the class. I mean, I don't know if you'd be happy or disappointed afterwards, but I'll try and give you a half a day's worth of material on it anyway, whatever we're doing. What is the struggle? I don't know what copy of the book you have. I know there's two of them out. This was the original. Sorry. The one with the shepherd. That was the the one that came out first, that was first edition. And then second edition was the one that's got the wood carving fight. But on either one of them, material's the same, just the, the endorsements and the book jackets are different, but the material inside. Uh, if you've got this one, turn to page 222. Uh, I want to basically work through the Digging Deeper Seminar 1 outline that I sent to you, but I want to give you something that I have uh, on an outline here where I call it the traditional paradigm on page 222. It's an appendage in the back of this one um, that I didn't put on this outline, but since uh, Lewis told me most of you had the book, uh, at least you'll sure get more out of the class if you've read the book. Um, uh, but at any rate, for those of you that haven't, I'm, I'm going to read something to you. 
uh, I ask, why is the subject of demonic warfare consistently ignored or mocked? Among many justified, sanctified, born-again, baptized, regenerated, saved, church-going, choir-singing, pew-throwing, hooping evangelical Christians. And I put four uh, suggestions down, or at least possibilities down. I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I want to catch these with you. In other words, why, when I go out speaking, I will have some churches say, would you spend the day talking about discipleship? I speak a lot on the area of transferable discipleship. I write quite a bit in that area. Uh, that's primarily what I do here at the church. I work with leadership development and uh, meaning elders and deacons, developing our leadership teams, and then the transferable discipleship. My little mantra on that is if I can do it, you can do it. And I think we've had classes on this. Harry or Chris or Lewis would remember where we've done some of the discipleship lessons just as examples but my little mantra is if i can do it you can do it uh, i don't want you following me with an umbilical cord stuck between you and me uh, the same god that lives in me lives in you the same spirit of god who lives in me lives in you anything i can do you ought to be able to do so my 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 job is to equip people to be who they're supposed to be not equip people to depend on me i don't want that but the why, as I go speaking crisscrossing the country on spiritual warfare, as I said, I have some people say, talk all about demons. I don't even care about the world and the flesh. And then I'll have other people say, talk all about the flesh. Don't bring up demons or just talk about discipleship and don't even bring the warfare thing up. Why? I mean, what? And I wrote, number one, one of the reasons the subject gets ignored is because of fear. I had one of the pastor, not, she uh, wasn't a pastor, she was a uh, children's ministry director. This was 30, more than 30 years ago. When I first started working with this in 1982, she walked into my office, closed the door, and she said, Carl, if you work with this demon stuff, they'll get you. And I said, they'll what? She said, well, they'll get you. Everybody knows that. The people that start working with demon stuff, they'll make you a a specific uh, point of con of reference and they'll come and get you and they'll get you. And I said to her, and she's gone now, she's passed, but, but she's with Jesus, but she meant, well, I said, I know you're trying to protect me, but what you're saying is that the God who loved me enough to die for me is not powerful enough to protect me. And the demonic order, which the creator created has more power to inflict harm on his creation than the creator has to keep his promise to protect us. That's fear. Why do I want to be motivated by fear? Jesus Christ is creator, John 1 says, of everything, one through three. Apart from him, nothing exists that exists. It means he created the angelic demonic order as well. He probably, you know, he created them as good, they went bad, so now we think of them as, as demons, but, but he's still creator. Why would I treat creator and creation as equals? Luke 10, 18 to 20, Jesus told his followers, if your name is written in heaven, I have given you authority to tread upon. It means step on. The serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, they shall no wise harm you. Do not, nevertheless, do not rejoice because demons are subject to you. Rejoice because your names are recorded in heaven. When Christians operate motivated by fear, 1 John, uh, says uh, you know chapter 418 that perfect love casts out fear why should I be motivated by fear but in reality what I'm doing is I'm taking a defeated created enemy and I am elevating that defeated enemy to a position of an equal and a colleague I refuse to do that fear says that demons have just as much authority to hurt you as Jesus does to protect you and I need to realize that's a lie and whether it's just motivated by my own silliness or whether it's motivated by a demon saying, don't learn about this or they'll get you, either one of them represent a lie. I'm on the side that wins. I'm victor. I am not on the side that loses. I am not victim. When I have Christians say I'm content playing the role of victim, I say, I pity you. I love you as a believer in Christ, but we're not victims. We're victors. So at any rate, what motivates a fear? Sometimes of getting involved with this, they'll get me. That's silly. Number two, I put ignorance. I don't know my Bible. I don't know who I am in Christ. Um, Dean Vandermeer, 
is in charge of a ministry called Set Free Ministries. I'll give him a plug. You need to get a hold of him. He's in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. He's good. I had him send me some of his little cards that uh, I liked it so much. I was speaking for him at one of his conferences, and he had these little cards, Who Am I in Christ? And there's probably 30 different reminders with Bible verses. Who am I in Christ? Inform yourself. Again, you're not victim, you're victor. So don't play the role of the victim. It's an insult to Christ. So fear can shut this down. Ignorance can shut it down. How about theological association? Well, in our school, our, our, our denomination, we always teach that. And what would someone think if we? So you purposely keep people in ignorance out of fear of what people in your theological associations or circles would think. That's pitiful. That will usually last until you finally end up in a situation like I did where you have to be able to deal with demonic issues. You don't know what you're doing and you can be mocked and ridiculed all day long or you can inform yourself to find out what does the Bible say about this and then don't approach it out of fear. Don't approach it out of arrogance. Don't out of, out of just, it's one more thing you deal with. Do I deal with evangelism? Yes. Prayer. Yes. Discipleship. Yes. Marriage counseling, sure. Teenagers, yes. There, there's so many different things you'll have to end up. Bible study, sure, that you end up dealing with. Leadership development, of course. One more thing is warfare. We have had we contend with real enemies, so learn how to recognize them and respond to them. And the last thing I put was religious hucksters. There are enough people on at 3 o'clock in the morning that you just drop your head and go, this just all looks crazy. And so, again, it's a little bit of that fear of association, but it's a little bit of there are genuinely people out there that take advantage of people. They cheat people. They swindle people. They play games and just go, I don't want to be associated with any of that. Uh, I've been burned. I was hurt way back when someone told my parents that, told me that, whatever it is. I'll never listen to any of this stuff again. I just, again, when you're sharing the faith and someone says, oh, I got burned in the church by those religious hypocrites, I go, religious hypocrites do not have anything to do with your salvation. Jesus Christ has everything to do with your salvation. If people are being hypocritical, they will pay for it one day. But whether there are great examples of Jesus or poor examples of Jesus, the one you're going to deal with, and the one I'm going to deal with is Jesus Christ. He's going to be the one that uh, the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ that I give an account to. So if someone uses, well, my neighbor, my parents, those hypocrites is an excuse because there are poor examples doesn't mean Christ isn't who he claimed to be. Because there are bad engineers that don't know what they're doing doesn't mean that all engineers don't know what they're doing. Because there are computer people that uh, would take your money and don't know what they're doing, if you're gullible enough to give it to them, they'll take it, doesn't mean there aren't people in that field that are really good at what they do and they know what they're doing. Because there are terrible teachers doesn't mean there aren't good teachers. I'm going to deal with Christ again. Well, those hucksters, I, go, I, don't, I don't care. I mean, I care that it's going on, but that's not my standard looking at the hucksters. Uh, again, don't run. Don't, don't glamorize, but don't run. Now, digging deeper, but what's the challenge? What do you do with Christians whose experience does not fit our theological suppositions regarding our views on spiritual warfare? When I came out of school, there was a the basic paradigm that I was trained with most people my age and 15, 20, 30 years younger and older was the same thing. There's oppression or there's possession. Oppression, it's a, it's an annoyance. Uh, oppression is, is uh, the uh, accusatory thinking in your brain, it's those goofy thoughts, uh, you're driving your car, uh, drive your car into those pylons and kill yourself. I would never do that. Where'd that thought come from? Oppression. Look at that woman. You know, what would she be about? Or look at that guy, whatever it is. No, that's, that's silly. I, I, I stand with Christ. It's, it's, Paul says in Ephesians 6.16, it's those arrows that I believe everyone who's in the faith has taken some of those arrows. If you never take arrows, I wonder if you're in the faith. I had a pastor in a chair, which would be to your left, my right, that came in and said, what am I doing wrong that I get shot at? 
and I asked him, how many times do you shoot dead people? And he looked at me for a second, and he said, well, if they're dead, why would you shoot at them? They're already dead. I said, you're right. I said, who do you shoot at? He said, well, your enemies. Demons see you as what? Well, I'm their enemy, because I love Jesus. I go, if you weren't their enemy, would they shoot at you? He goes, well, there'd be no need. I'm not bothering them. Well, you asked me, what am I doing wrong that they shoot at me? Maybe that's the wrong question. Maybe you should be saying, maybe I am doing something right, and they don't like that. Because their job is to first keep me away from Jesus for salvation. If they fail at that, then how do I keep you discouraged and distracted so you never think you'll measure up? So the fact that you're catching some of those arrows, we all do. What's the purpose to keep me from feeling confident walking with Jesus? If you're from a demon, it's like, I can't keep you out of heaven, so my plan B is just to distract you, right? So is it a bad thing or a good thing that you get shot at sometimes? I've said it's a badge of honor. I don't invite it. I don't want it. But it's a reminder to me this isn't my home. So at any rate, I, I was taught through Bible school and seminary both. I went to good Bible school. I went to good seminary. And I know from working with colleagues around the country, very much the same. Yes, there's oppression. It's that annoyance. And then there's possession. That's the, that's the Luke 8. That's the, the demoniac and the gatherings that... Uh, that runs around buck naked, he howls at the moon, he breaks chains, he hurts people, everyone's scared of him. And I go, I've never seen too many people like that. Well, that's the person involved with demons. So either you have oppression, which is just an annoyance, no big deal, or you have people that are just flat out crazy and ought to be locked up somewhere. And so I don't see very many of these people in my church. And it seems like everybody, if they recognize it, gets whacked with this kind of stuff sometimes. So why make a big deal over the demonic stuff? Just ignore this stuff and pray for this poor pitiful fool, right? Because, you know, they're just gone anyway. Uh, what happens with people that are in between? You've got them in your churches. You've got them in your homes. You may deal with this for all I know. I don't know how many are watching this or listening to this. I've never cared about the numbers. I just say, I told Harry, if Lewis, if you want me to teach, I'll teach. I don't care whether there's five of you or 50 of you or 500 of you or 5,000. It doesn't matter. But, well, I know I'm a Christian. And I know that this is supposed to be an annoyance. But what I'm dealing with seems like way more than just an annoyance. But it's not over here where there's no self-will. It's like I'm somewhere in between. On your paper, I said, let's define terms. Oppression is a term often used to describe external spiritual harassment. It's quite normal in the life of a growing Christian, although there seems to be a wide latitude in the intensity of this type of attack. And I gave you the Ephesians 6 and the Revelation 12 that we looked at last hour. Possession is a word typically uh, used to describe an internal condition experienced by non-Christians, totally controlled and dominated by demonic spirits. It connotates the complete loss of self-control. Self-will is often incorrectly defined, defined by the word ownership. Demons don't own anything. Demons are squatters. Demons are created beings. There's only one owner. That's God the creator. If someone says they're, they're controlled by demons, oh, you're saying they're demon-possessed, I go, if you mean demon controlled, I would say yes, that's a possibility. If you say demon owned, I would say no, squatters don't own anything. And they just come in and try and destroy something that was already made, God's creator. Uh, I think there's a third category. I think it explains people who are in the middle. It's more, what I'm dealing with seems a lot more difficult than just simple oppression, but it doesn't seem like it's this total subjugation it's somewhere in between demonization describes varying degrees of active demonic control in the life of a person and i give you luke 13 uh, talking about the the woman who uh, jesus identified as a daughter of abraham of abraham of galatians 3 very very clear romans and galatians both say that we are children of abraham children of faith uh, Abraham believed God and this was counted to him as righteousness. Uh, they believed in a Messiah who was coming. We believe in a Messiah who has come. But both of us had our faith in Messiah 
saved by grace through faith, a free gift, children of Abraham. That's why they'll say Abraham is the father of the faith, both for the Jew and the Christian. Uh, Bible talks in the New Testament, disciples of Moses, uh, they, they weren't Christians. They were disciples of Moses. But when people were identified as sons of Abraham or daughters of Abraham, they were sons or daughters having the faith of Abraham, the one who was justified when he be, when he believed. Uh, why is that interesting to me? Because the pair of the uh, story that he tells about the woman, this daughter of Abraham, bent over by a spirit for thirteen years, uh, eighteen years. Excuse me, it's Luke thirteen. Jesus freed her of that. Uh, I give you Acts chapter five, one through five, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, clearly, they were people that were identified as Christians in the church. Nowhere does it say they weren't Christians. What comes out is they were disobedient Christians. They were deceivers. In, uh, in verses 3 and 4, Peter asks Ananias after he lies to him, he says, uh, you haven't lied to men, you've lied to God. Well, he says, before that, you lied to the Holy Spirit. The land was yours. You didn't have to lie. You didn't lie to men, you lied to God. Interesting verse identifying the Holy Spirit as who? God. But more important, sandwiched right in it. He says, plerao is the Greek where he goes, why have you allowed Satan to control your mind? That's an interesting comment because Ananias, there's no reason to believe he wasn't a believer unless you're just an ideologue that doesn't want to have to deal with it. The same root is used in Ephesians chapter 5 when we're told that we're to be filled with the Spirit. Remember Ephesians 5, 18? 17 says don't waste time. 18 says don't be drunk on wine. It leads to dissipation, but rather be filled, be controlled. Play around, but be filled or controlled by the Spirit. An obedient Christian can be filled or controlled by the Spirit, and it produces 19 and 20, say, songs and hymns and all good stuff. Or a believer can choose to be disobedient, like Ananias. Same words used, play right. Why have you allowed Satan to control your mind? It doesn't say own you, but you gave him a place in your mind to control you, and it's going to cost you your life. Same word used by the same Holy Spirit who inspired both texts. Neither one of them talk about ownership it's talking about degrees of control so i have suggested instead of saying that the paradigm is sacrosanct either a person deals with oppression or they deal with possession i'll say that's incomplete what if i have oppression it's light it's an annoyance not that big a deal yes there's possession doesn't mean ownership it just means totally subjugated like the demoniac in in, in the luke 8 but what if you also have, remember, demon is amenos. I've given you, you know, the etymology of it. It means a demon caused passivity. Demons can't take your soul. Demons just want you to shut down. Uh, Jesus says, I want you to walk with me. They'll say, you can't do that. You're not adequate. Jesus will say, I want you to confess your sin. Oh, there's too much for it, demons. They'll tell you, why do you even try? Jesus will say, I want you to know you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and, uh, I've equipped you to serve me. They'll say, no, you're inadequate. You're terribly made. God made mistakes on you. They want you to go passive. They want you, instead of actively resisting them and actively walking with Christ, they want you to go passive and just say, I can't. What's the use of trying? See, it doesn't keep you out of heaven. It just keeps you so frustrated and discouraged you don't help anybody else get there. So if I say, yes, there's oppression, yes, there's possession, where the, the, the control is very light, it's very heavy here, demon idzomenos is just something, a, a word participles used 12 times, just saying it's degrees of control. It's sometimes used of believers, it's sometimes used of unbelievers. Okay. In other words, if I, the, the, we'll go through this as, as, we work, as we work through more of this, I'll just wait. We'll take it in order. But what am I saying? Define the problem. Paradigms are not sacrosanct. Paradigms are man-made. Because my teachers taught me here's the paradigm doesn't mean that I have to accept that if it's inadequate. And I'm telling you that in, I've never so far had missionaries out on the field say I don't believe in demonic activity. I get missionaries emailed, call me regularly saying we just need some help being more effective dealing with it because you know, in North America, we kind of ridicule it. And over here, it's a reality we deal with all the time. 
So what am I suggesting? Instead of running from this group, isolating this group, telling this group either you're not saved or you're not sincere. If you're dealing with something that is, is anything tougher than just simple oppression, then either one, you prayed a prayer, but you never got saved. Well, except they know they did get saved and they do walk with God. They do memorize. Or you're just making this up. You're a drama queen or king. You're just trying to get attention. No, I'm not trying to do that either. What I'm telling you is what I'm experiencing is different from your paradigm. Then instead of challenging the sincerity or the sanity of the believer, why don't you challenge your paradigm that says maybe the paradigm's wrong? Maybe a better paradigm is yes, there's oppression, yes, there's demonization, and yes, there's possession. All degrees of control and people fall somewhere on the spectrum with it. From it's no big deal to where it's absolutely debilitating to where it's somewhere in between. Define terms. Verses. I'm not going to go through all of them now because I've taken too much time. But what I said here was, and you've got it on your outline, the New Testament addresses the issue of demonic warfare in a straightforward, matter-of-fact manner rather than a novel oddity. Look at Ephesians 6, men and women, the whole thing. You know, three chapters of who you are in Christ, chapter 4, what should it look like in the church, chapter 5, what should it look like in your home, at work, with your husbands, wives, and children, and then chapter 6, a warning, don't forget. All that I've told you, Paul's saying is true, but you've got opposition. Remember verse 12, our battle is not against flesh and blood, it's against principalities. He's talking to believers talking about the reality of spiritual warfare. Why should I say, what a shock? He would have said it's normal. Revelation 12, we already looked at it. We're accused day and night. Ephesians 4, 25 through 27. Topos. Now, I'll get to that again. I'll probably pick it up. But remember Paul in Ephesians 4, 26, talking to Christians, says, deal quickly with your sin. That's how you can paraphrase it. Do not allow the sun to go down on your anger. You could say, do not allow the sun to go down on your immaturity, on your immorality, your sensuality, your anger, your unforgiveness, your bitterness. You could plug in anything there you want. His point was not just to say there's only one issue to deal with, and that's anger. His point was, deal quickly with your sin. Why? Verse 27. You do not want to give topos, a place, a space, or a territory of control. That's what the word meant. Most of your translations say a foothold, a handhold, an opportunity. He's saying in verse 26, deal quickly with your sin. Why? You do not want to give opportunity or footholds. Or etymologically, it means a place, a space, or a territory of control. To who? To the devil. Well, but he's talking to believers. Absolutely true. And he's saying when we walk, dealing with our sin, we confess it. We don't let it stack up. The devil has nothing or his demons have nothing to hold on to us with. Because when we confess, Christ cleanses. But if I choose not to confess sin and I allow it to stack up, I potentially create places or spaces or territories or handholds, use the translate, of, of opposition from the devil, which he wants to control. And it's interesting. Do the study. The place, the space, and the territory of control were real. They weren't theoretical. They were used of real places, spaces, or territories or controls. As a Christian, I don't want to give a place or a space or a territory of control to the enemy. I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 2, Paul says, we're not unaware of Satan's methods or his schemes. I have said in North America, we're very unaware of it. We deny it. We run from it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, very interesting. Verse 1, Paul says, put up with me. Verse 2, I introduced you to Christ. Uh, you were walking in purity in your devotion to Christ. Verse 3, I'm afraid for you, at least just as the serpent deceived Eve, so you're being deceived in your mind. Where we say the attack is sometimes physical, most of the time mental. Where did Satan go after Eve in her mind? Has God really said, don't you know? Paul here says, I led you to Christ. I'm your spiritual dad. You're walking in purity in your faith. And now I'm concerned for you, at least you're being deceived just as, just as the serpent deceived Eve. How? Verse 4, you talk about a Jesus other than the one that we preach. Uh, you're, you're involving yourself. You're receiving a spirit other than the one that you had already received. Romans 8, 9 says, when you became a believer, the Holy Spirit came in you. He says, if you don't have the spirit, you don't belong to Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, we were all made uh, baptized by one of the same spirit. We were all made to partake of that same spirit. When? When you became a believer. 
Uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says that when you believed, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Well, if these are believers, and Paul says they were, they'd been sincere, but now they've been deceived into talking about a different Jesus and getting involved with different spirits. And he says, and then promoting a different gospel. And you put up with it. Where does he say it came from? From the serpent deceiving you in your mind, just like he did with Eve. So much for the nonsense about if you're a believer and you're reading your Bible, demons can't have anything to do with you. That's naive. It may be sincere, but it's naive. Uh, they respond by saying, well, they told us they were uh, teachers, apostles like you. 13 through 15 in 2 Corinthians 11. Their boss prays himself as an angel of light. Why would you be surprised that his emissaries parade themselves as, as teachers of righteousness or apostles or whatever? Uh, in other words, he didn't, he didn't accept their excuse. Well, we changed what we were thinking because apostles or angels or whatever told us. He says, no, 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 no. No, no, no. They're like their boss. But where's the battle? In their brain. What is it? They start teaching bad theology instead of good theology and living wrong instead of right. And they were believers. Very interesting passage. Matthew 4. Jesus said he was responding to Satan, to his solicitation. Someone says to me, well, I just figure as long as I'm walking with God, they won't solicit me. Well, are you more righteous than Christ? If they are willing to solicit Jesus and take him on, why in the world would I ever think I walk so righteous they wouldn't bother me? Well, because if I'm solicited by the devil, I must be doing something wrong. Would Jesus ever do anything wrong? He was perfect. But they still said, turn the rocks to bread. They still said, why don't you jump off the temple so people will finally give you the acclaim you deserve when, you're not, when you don't die? Or why don't you just bow down and worship me? Then you don't have to go to the cross. Jesus didn't say, I'm not hearing this, this isn't real. He just said, he quoted scripture three times, and then he said, get lost. Get lost. Clearly, clearly the, the devil, according to Jesus, is real, and he clearly solicits. And Jesus responded, not in getting sucked into a long conversation. You know, you worship God and him only. Get lost. But there was no denial of the reality of demonic solicitation. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5, we've been given weaponry that's, that's not natural, it's supernatural. And it destroys empty speculation raised against Christ, and it tears down strongholds, demonic strongholds, that who gets involved in? Well, Christians, that's who he's talking to in 2 Corinthians 10. Luke 9, remember Peter and John? Jesus, we see these people dealing with demons, and they're not part of our band of 12. Should we tell them to knock it off? Jesus, wow, they're doing what? They're involved with demons? Why don't they know if they're not one of my 12? They shouldn't be doing any of this. They don't have authority to do this. Tell them to knock it off before they get hurt. What did Jesus tell them? Leave them alone. They're not against you. They're for you. We already quoted Luke 10. I have given you the authority to tread upon. Serpents, scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Oh, that's just the 12. No, read 17. The 70 return with joy, saying, Jesus, in your name, even demons are subject to us. I have given you authority. It's not about your gifting. It's not about your personality. It's delegated authority given from Christ. What? The demons are subject to you through my authority, through my delegated authority. You're protected by me. They shall in no wise harm you. Don't rejoice because demons are subject to you. It's not a big deal. Rejoice because your name's recorded in heaven. If your name's recorded in heaven, you've been given delegated authority that is greater than demonic. Why? Because our boss, Jesus, is greater than their boss, a created fallen angel. So I don't make a big deal out of it. I don't say I'm a demon buster, but on the other hand, I don't run from it either. Uh, Luke 19, what happened when people tried to get involved with demons or outside of Christ? Remember the demons with the sons of Sceva? Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? As a non-Christian, you don't want to be messing with demons. Uh, you don't have delegated authority to mess with them. Their delegated authority is greater. They don't fear you. They actually don't even fear Christians. They fear Christ who lives in the Christian. It's not your personality. It's not your gifting again. Luke 10, we already talked about. Luke 13, we already talked about. The woman bent over by a spirit who Christ set free. He identifies as a daughter of Abraham which was traditionally used, meaning you have the faith of the father Abraham, which was faith through 
believing God, not through uh, mosaic work. And then Acts 1 through 5, we already talked about the Ananias and Sapphira. The only reason you would uh, deny Ananias and Sapphira were believers if you ideologically do not want to have to deal with this. No contextual reason to assume that. What have I said? Top of the next page. When man-made paradigms collide with an error in Scripture, man-made paradigms must bow to Scripture. Paradigms just supposed to help me systematize my thinking. They're man-made, but if they're inadequate, then change them. Don't change Scripture to match match up with the paradigm. Change the paradigm to match up with Scripture. Scripture's bottom line. <laughs> I wrote number one: religious traditions are not always biblically based, even if they're popular. My dad, who was not a Christian until the last nine months of his life, told me the Bible said God helps those who help themselves. Have you ever heard that? I grew up hearing it most of my life. <laughs> when I became a Christian, I tried to find that verse. God helps those who help themselves. I could never find it because it's not there. I thought it was. If I asked people in church, if I got up in front of most churches preaching and said, how many of you have been told that the Bible teaches God helps those who help themselves? Have you ever found that verse? Where is that? You'd have people trying to, yeah, I've heard that. I can't find it either. Sometimes stuff that's sent, sent out of the tradition doesn't make it factual. Number two, truth will pass reality tests that tradition ignores, ridicules, or redefines. What am I talking about? When you watch people who have been demonized set free, it was more difficult than just oppression. That's just a nuisance. Certainly wasn't the Gadarene demoniac or the Gerizene demoniac. But what they were dealing with, Carl, my whole life I've heard my head. Jesus doesn't love you anymore. You're fat, you're ugly, you're stupid. No one likes you. It's never going to change. Why do you try? Why do you read your Bible? You don't get anything out of it. You can read novels for hours and you fall asleep reading your Bible in minutes. You're not even really a Christian. You don't care about God's love. Uh, God used to love you. He doesn't love you now. You're, you're isolated. You're all alone. No one loves you. No one cares about you. Churches are all rip-offs. Pastors are all hypocrites. Your religious friends just use you. They don't like you. Boom, 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 boom. When you watch people free of that and say all that nonsense stopped, dealt with the topos, dealt with the places, the spaces, the territory, the sin that opened me up, because instead of dealing quickly, don't let the sun go down on your sin, I played games with that stuff. And I paid the dues dearly until I finally dealt with it, but I'm free. I'm saying truth passes a reality test. Uh, I've, I've just seen too many people set free from that stuff. Uh, you can redefine it. You can ridicule it. But it still leaves people stuck in bondage. Traditional paradigm is often used to explain demonic warfare. leaves too many genuine Christians on the outside looking in. We've talked about that. Fourthly, should we challenge the sincerity and salvation of a person under demonic attack? or the biblical basis and validity of the paradigm simply presumed to be true. Who should care? I put number one, Christians who are being tormented in demonic bondage. They would care. And I put number two, how about any Christian with the willingness to be courageous enough and available to help someone stuck in that condition? And instead of blowing them off as an afterthought, well, they're just not really Christians. They respond to the same gospel you did. Well, they don't read their scripture. They probably read it more often than you do. Well, they don't memorize. Yeah, a lot of them do. Well, I just don't understand their experience. Then just say that. I don't relate with their experience because I feel freedom. That doesn't mean that the torment that they feel like they're going through, you're this, you're that, is not true. You can be glad you're not experiencing that, but you don't write them off as insincere or insane people. What if they're really going through that? People that actually care want to be shepherds instead of hirelings should care. How do you tell the difference between demonic accusation and Holy Spirit conviction? I gave you some of these already. The Holy Spirit doesn't contradict Scripture. If what they're hearing, and by hearing I mean I've had people say, I hear these words, I get these thoughts, I have these ideas pop in my brain. This idea was just there, but, but it's almost always condemning. Jesus doesn't love you. You're fat, you're stupid, you're ugly, etc., etc. Uh, I'm suggesting the Holy Spirit of God doesn't contradict himself. If he says you're valuable, then you're valuable. Anything saying you're not, maybe it's you. Maybe you're making it up. Maybe you're just thinking poorly. Maybe you read a bad movie. Maybe you watched a scary movie or a, 
uh, read something you shouldn't, but the Holy Spirit of God is not going to tell you that he doesn't forgive your sin when you confess or that you're a horrible person. You may be a disobedient person, but you're valuable because Christ died for you. <clears throat> so I said, check pronouns. We talked about that. Demons typically launch their arrows at you saying, you this, you that, you always, you never. Most Christians that have been going through it for years will personalize it, flip the pronouns and say, I'm fat, I'm ugly, I'm stupid. When I say, slow it down, what do you really hear? They'll say, you're this, you're that, you always. That's how demons communicate. Is it general or specific? We talked about that. Demons want it general enough that they can suck you into a game. If it's real specific, you'll, you'll deal with it. It's just obedience, disobedience. But when it's so general, then I go on the fishing trips going, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. I wonder, I'm not sure. Why this, why that? And then two hours later, I'm going, boy, what a failure I am. Look at all the time I wasted. They got what they wanted. They discouraged you. Offensive prayer. Uh, I encourage people, pray offensively. If you're dealing with demonic oppression, offensive prayer will take care of it. If you're dealing with demonization, it won't take care of it. Well, it's offensive prayer. Most of us... Um, most of us pray defensively, like a Psalm 18 or a Psalm 27, which essentially say, God, hide me. Protect me and hide me. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying don't pray and ask for God's protection. But um, <clears throat> I start reading through like a Psalm 35, um, Psalm 58, Psalm 83, Psalm 91, Psalm 109, Jeremiah 18, 18 to 23, Nehemiah 4, 4 and 5. Those are verses where uh, like David says, uh, when my when my enemies lay nets down for me, catch them in their own devices. Uh, when my enemies uh, shoots arrows, shatter their teeth. In other words, return their teeth to their mouth, shatter their teeth. Um, that's not a defensive prayer saying, hide me. Uh, remember David, contend with those who contend against me. Fight against the ones who are fighting against me. That's an offensive prayer. So if I am uh, if I'm working on a, a talk here at my computer and I hear you're too stupid to put together a talk that will help anybody, instead of thinking I'm going crazy or running from it, I'll just pray, Lord Jesus, if that was a demon that just tried to discourage me, telling me I'm too stupid to have a talk ready for this group, would you kick that sucker's teeth in for it and tell him I'm off limits? Thank you in Jesus' name. Something says to you, you're worthless. God doesn't love you anymore. He doesn't forgive your sin anymore. Uh, you're a pain in his behind. You know, you, he doesn't want anything to do with you. My offensive prayer would be, Lord God, if that was a demon that just told me you don't love me again, I'm a pain in your behind, you know, et cetera. Would you just kick that sucker to the curb and tell him I'm off limits? Thank you in Jesus' name. You're fat, you're ugly, and you're stupid. Lord, the one that just said I'm fat, ugly, and stupid, beat that sucker up for me. Fight against the one fighting against me. Undermine the one that's trying to undermine me. I can pray that way. I do pray that way, and it works. Instead of going through hours of this, you're terrible, you're no good. Offensive prayer will stop it. If you're dealing with oppression, that's all you need to do. If they show back up a week later, a day later, saying, okay, we're back for round two, you can either be scared and go, oh, no that archer's back for round two, or you can just say, Lord, the idiot that's back for round two that just said I'm back, clobber that sucker for me. Tell him I'm off limits. Thank you in Jesus' name. He'll do it. He'll do it. And then you walk on. That's why I learned I'm victor. I'm not victim. I'm not playing the role of the victim. If a person says to me, I pray offensively, and it just doesn't stop, it just doesn't stop, then I'm going to say, my guess is you're dealing with demonization. Not oppression. Offensive prayer will take care of that. But if you have given, through sin, a place, a space, or a territory for a demon to hang out, that's a place since you don't want Christ to control it. You're involved in immorality. You think no one knows about it? God knows about it. Demons also know about it. So you think God doesn't care? Why? He hasn't killed me yet. You go, you open up a place, a space, or a territory, demons will start controlling that area to where after a while you go, I'm out of control. I'm scared now wasn't because God abandoned you. It was because I was foolish enough through my sin to give a place, a space, or a territory of control. If demonization has occurred and you pray offensively, Lord, that demon that just told me I'm a fool and you hate me, tell it to get lost, it, it'll, it'll, back, it'll back it up. Offensive prayer will back it up even when there's demonization. 
but you'll feel like you no sooner kick something off the front porch and it's at the back porch saying, you'll never get rid of me. So I pray again, Lord, that one on the back porch, tell it to take a walk. It'll take a walk. It'll show up at the sliding door saying, I already told you, I'm stronger than Jesus. You'll never get rid of me. Well, that's a lie. But if you believe it, then go, well, I guess there's no point in praying to Jesus because this doesn't work. No, it works. And when there's oppression, it'll stop it. But if there's demonization, you have got to be willing to deal with whatever opened the door to them in the first place. Then it'll stop. Once you say that stops, I want that stuff to get lost. So what am I suggesting? Offensive prayer. If I deal, if I pray offensively and it clears the whole thing up, praise God, I'm just dealing with oppression. The Holy Spirit convicts us to get back on our feet and serve Christ. Holy Spirit does not tell us we're perpetual losers. The Spirit of God would never do that. How are Christians potentially demonized? Two ways that I know of. Habitual sin, that's the Ephesians 4. I play games, I don't deal with sin, I end up opening up topos, the place, the space, or the territory. Or generational sin or ancestral sin, and I've listed five or six different, or far more than that. Is it true that demons can take advantage of, of uh, others through ancestral sin? The answer is yes. I don't like it, but the New Testament nowhere uh, abrogates that. And uh, anyone that says, I choose not to believe that, you can choose not to believe it, but it doesn't mean you don't have to deal with the reality of it. So those are the only two ways I know, either my own sin or ancestral sin. How do you discern the difference between demonic oppression and demonization? I put demons don't go on vacation. When I'm dealing with oppression, it's sporadic. It's over here. It's not that big a deal. When it's something that feels like it's 24-7, even if it's not, that's more like the demonization. That's more like where they've been given a foothold, a handhold, a place, a space, a territory. It just doesn't seem to stop. As a matter of fact, it seems like the longer it goes, the more compelling it becomes. So if someone says there's never any break in it, I will say that's typically a way to tell the difference between the oppression and the demonization. The one, there's breaks. The other, feels like there are no breaks. Arrows can fly. They should not fill the sky. Here's what I mean by that. If you were looking at one of my bookcases i don't think on this camera you can see it but you know just think of a of a door a window if someone says yeah i deal with an occasional arrow it's like there's this window and and along comes this little little arrow and i get hit with it but i walk on i say that's silly person's talking about what ephesians six sixteen, demons shooting arrows you can have another christian say carl you talk about an arrow when i look at that window that window is just filled with millions of arrows. If I put my shield up here, I get whacked down here. If I put the shield down, I get whacked up here. If I put it in front of me, I get whacked behind me. I put it behind me, I get whacked in front of me. It's like I can't get away from it. There's too many. Both of those people are talking about what? Arrows. Both of them are talking about those accusatory remarks. But for one of them, it's oppressive. It's just not that big a deal. For the other one, it is debilitating, compelling. It's like, I just can't get away. I start playing the role of the victim. That's why you'll have one Christian saying, it's just an error. Why don't you suck it up? Why don't you act like some backbone? What's your problem? You know, grow up. And then the one that's going through the beat down says, well, why don't you get some compassion? I thought Christians were supposed to love people. You're so judgmental. You know, they're both talking about arrows, but they're living in two different spaces. Who has authority to confront demons? Non-Christians? No. You get yourself in trouble. Chris, I put Acts 19 again. Sons of Sceva. Christians, yes. Luke chapter 10, 18 to 20. I have given you authority. The same God who lives in me lives in you. The same authority delegated to me delegated to you. Does confronting demons depend upon spiritual gifts? No. Does it depend upon fasting? No. Does it depend upon how many verses you have memorized? No. It depends upon delegated authority of Christ. If Christ lives in you, demons have to deal with you. As long as you understand enough about it, you can tell them, take a walk, and they will. If you don't understand, you can have a gift, but if you never open it, you don't know what's in it. It doesn't mean someone didn't give you a gift. It just means you don't know what's in it. Christ has delegated authority for believers to say, I do not have to put up with their mess. I refuse. They don't fear you, but they will fear the Christ in you. And if they know you know, they'll say, get it over with. If they don't think you know what you're doing, they'll say stuff like I heard when I first started. You're a fool. You're stupid. You don't know what you're doing. We're not going anywhere. You can't make us go. We're stronger than Christ. None of that is true. But if you're willing to believe that baloney, they'll back you off. 
we'll get you. If you decide to help that person, then we'll turn our attention on you. So now you're supposed to be motivated by what? Fear. Instead of helping someone, you're supposed to run. Baloney. I'm protected by Christ. But if I'm willing to believe the baloney, they are willing to continue to throw the baloney at me. Um, maybe enough said on that. We'll pick up some more of this in another one. Let me see if I've got anything else. I got just a little bit. Yeah, I'm pretty good. Um, on the last page, all I gave you on that was Dr. Fred Dickinson, 34 years at Moody, 26 years head of their theology department. He uh, gives you the etymology of the word demonids of Enos. You know, the, the participle or demonids of my the verb means demon caused passivity. What? Why is that important? Demons don't own you. Doesn't mean demon ownership. Demons want to put you in a role of passive victim. You can't. If you want to play that role, you can play it, but you don't have to. And if you see Christians in it, you don't have to say you're not a Christian. You don't have to say you're insane. Maybe you can say there's been some disobedience that needs to be dealt with. And if I'm someone that says, I'm just so spiritual, I just read my Bible, and I never have to go through with that, pride stinks. Pride stinks. No, you shouldn't have to go through demonic warfare. But if a person has opened themselves up to it through habitual sin or generational sin, and they're saying, my experience is tougher, don't blow them off. Are there drama kings and queens that make stuff up for attention? Sure, there are. Have I had to deal with that? Sure. Is everybody I talk with saying they're dealing with demons, dealing with demons? The answer is no. But there are many of them that are, that have felt kicked out of their own church on the outside looking in, saying, I would never share what I'm really thinking or feeling. I had a pastor come here. I'll end with this. I had a pastor come here who was demonized. Big church. Mega church. Probably bigger than any church any of you attend or pastor. Certainly bigger than anything I've ever been a part of, and I've been a part of some big churches. He said, I told my elders I was going fishing. He said, I didn't want to tell them I was concerned about demonic activity because I could lose my job. At least I'm afraid they would lose confidence in me. So I just said, I'm going on a fishing trip because that's kind of what I'm doing. I don't know exactly what I'm doing, so help me go fishing on this demonic question. He was demonized. We dealt with it. Someone says, well, if you're a pastor, you're a missionary, and you're involved in Christian work, demons wouldn't have anything to do with you. I'd say, actually, you're probably a more tempting target than the other. And yes, I deal with pastors, and I have missionaries. I've had missionaries not only in country. I've had missionaries flying here talking about this from out of the country. They'll say, I've read your book. You're writing about me, and we don't even know each other. How, what did I do wrong? I said, maybe it's because you're trying to serve Christ and they want to slow you down. Maybe it's because you've gotten involved with Topos. Maybe it's because you've opened doors to them. Then deal with it. Or maybe it's just because they don't like you. That's a badge of honor. We'll, we'll, we'll keep on after lunch. God bless you.